Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on an ASMR tour of a beautiful and rather extraordinary natural history museum, the Fogelsile, which is tucked away in a corner of the medieval town of Bamberg in Germany. I've described this museum in the video title as the most gorgeous zoological museum in the world. And of course, it's a subjective matter because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. However, as someone who loves late Baroque and early neoclassical architecture and decoration, I really love this museum. And hopefully you will, too. It's certainly an extraordinary place, a genuine curiosity, and it's also something of a secret, because it's hidden away within a larger complex of buildings, so not many people find it. Today, however, we are going to find it. We're going to go on a virtual audio tour and explore the museum for ourselves. And as usual, there'll be a slideshow of images to accompany our ASMR adventure. These are all photographs that I took myself during my visit to the museum, and I'm afraid they are just snapshots taken on my phone. So apologies if there are lots of reflections from the tall windows or the old museum cabinet glass. Hopefully you will still enjoy looking at them. But, of course, if you prefer, you don't have to look at them at all. Instead, you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the Bamberger Vogelsile. Vogelsile translates into English as bird hall. And that, in essence, is what this museum is. It's a magnificent and highly decorative hall, spread over two levels, which is filled with an extraordinary display of rather old zoological specimens, many of which happen to be birds. To find the museum, you need to know where you're going, because it's squirreled away through an arch within a complex of university buildings. And even when you first reach the museum, you wouldn't think, from stepping into the entrance hall, that there's a 200-year-old museum hidden away inside. Because when you first go in, the entrance is very modern. And in fact, the outer museum, which is the Bamberg Natural History Museum, is all pretty contemporary in its design. Ah, uh, the layouts are very modern, and there are lots of multimedia displays and touch screens to look at. However, if you know where you're going, and you climb up two flights of stairs to the second floor of the building, you can walk through a glass door and literally step into another world. A complete 18th century natural history cabinet that appears to be perfectly frozen in time. Let's go in through that glass door now and discover the bird hall for ourselves. It's a magnificent room, around 15 metres long, with a double height, vaulted ceiling, a balustraded gallery at first floor level, and eight tall windows that flood the hall with natural light. The room is predominantly decorated in white, with accents of azure blue and gold, and the walls are lined with elegant cabinets and painted panelling, which is ornamented with elaborate friezes, elegant neoclassical mouldings and swags of flowers. It's an extremely decorative room, the sort of thing you would expect to find in a palace rather than a museum. And as we pause to take in the stunning effect of all this wonderful decoration, let me tell you a little bit about how it came to be in the first place. 
the Bird Hall was founded by Franz Ludwig von Ertal, who was born in 1730 and who became the Prince Bishop of Bamberg and Würzburg, which is a nearby city. Like most Prince Bishops of the era, he was incredibly wealthy, but he was also a genuine enthusiast for Enlightenment principles that championed the education of man and wanted to improve the common lot of humanity. So, backing up his principles with his money, Franz Ludwig founded a number of institutions for the benefit of the Bamberg citizens, uh, including the first modern hospital in Bamberg, as well as several schools within the university. And in 1791, he decided to create a hall of zoological learning so that the students could study every natural specimen known to man. Being a prince bishop, he of course commissioned his court architect, Lawrence Fink, to create the new building. And rather than design something from scratch, he asked Fink to create the building within the walls of an old Jesuit college, which Fink did. He remodelled the original building and created this long hall with a mezzanine gallery level so that there would be two floors of exhibits. And then when Fink had finished building, Franz Ludwig then called in his court sculptor and ordered him to decorate it in the same beautiful neoclassical style that he enjoyed at his own residence. The result is this astonishingly beautiful interior which perhaps looks a little bit incongruous when contrasted with the stuffed zoological exhibits that line every wall. Nevertheless, it's this combination that makes the Bird Hall so unique and unforgettable. So let's begin exploring it now by taking a look at the ground floor of the museum. Although the collection includes hundreds of mammals, reptiles and invertebrates, most of the exhibits down here on the ground floor are birds. And most of them are more than 200 years old. They were originally collected by Dionysus Linda, who interestingly began his career as a monk, but then became the first curator of the museum after his monastery was dissolved in 1803. The collection was expanded in the mid-19th century by Linda's successor, Andreas Haupt, but since that time, the hall has more or less stayed the same. It's been changed occasionally and superficially for restoration or cleaning, but today it looks very much as it did 200 years ago. And as we walk into the room, we're met by one of those 200-year-old, beautiful decorative features. An ornate, 18th-century pyramid-shaped cabinet, which is topped with a striped gold-and-blue decorative urn, ornamented with a gilded flame. The cabinet contains a delicate collection of nests and bird eggs, and each type of egg is mounted carefully in an individual circle of cardboard to show off its fragile beauty. Opposite the pyramid cabinet, in the centre of the eastern wall of the museum, we'll find a much larger wall cabinet that holds a very impressive exhibit, a fully grown ostrich. Ostriches are the largest living species of bird in the world and they also have the largest eyes of any land vertebrate, which they use to spot predators from a great distance. Being flightless birds, they escape from these predators by running, and their long, powerful legs allow them to reach speeds of up to 73 kilometres, or 40 miles per hour. This ostrich is a particularly tall exhibit, and it's been on display in the bird hall for 190 years having been brought to the museum in 1830. Opposite the ostrich, there's a bank of freestanding display cabinets that run down the centre of the room and divide the ground floor of the hall into two separate aisles. The birds that are exhibited in these freestanding central cabinets are all European, while the birds that are displayed around the edges of the room in the wall cabinets 
are all classed as exotic, which means they come from the four other continents of Asia, Africa, Australia, and the Americas. The first collection of European birds we come to are birds of prey, and they include eagles, falcons, owls, and vultures. Vultures are commonly feared and shunned by humans because they're scavenger birds that feed upon the carcasses of other animals. Consequently, in both literature and art, they're often depicted as greedy predators who hang around waiting for death to strike. This makes them very unpopular, and even Charles Darwin referred to them as disgusting birds. However, I must confess that personally, I think vultures are rather misunderstood. Their scavenging behaviour means they rarely actually kill for food, which, if you think about it, makes them one of the most benign and least violent meat-eaters on the planet. They're also nature's recyclers, usefully tidying up after other predators. And while this might make them distasteful to modern societies, in the ancient world, they were frequently revered. The ancient Egyptians viewed vultures as symbols of compassion and protection. And in Persian mythology, the bearded vulture, of which we can see a very fine specimen here in the museum, was considered to be an omen of luck and prosperity. There are so many exhibits on display in this room. It would take me all day to stop and talk to you about all of them. But as we continue down this north aisle of the hall, we can admire a collection of aquatic birds on the upper shelves and a collection of smaller passerines, or songbirds, on the lower shelves of the central cabinet. Meanwhile, on the opposite wall, in one of the exotic cabinets, we'll find two incredibly elderly specimens of a marabou stork and a scarlet ibis, both of which, after 200 years, look rather as though they're beginning to molt their feathers, although the ibis still retains its vivid red and pink plumage. But as you cross the aisle to examine it, be careful where you walk, because otherwise you might trip over an enormous bone that's lying along the floor. This is one half of the lower jaw from a bowhead whale a type of baleen whale that lives in the Arctic and has the largest mouth of any living creature. If we step carefully over the whalebone, we can walk into the corner of the Northern Isle, where we'll find two adjacent wall cabinets containing a colourful selection of parrots, and in between them a small, obelisk-shaped freestanding cabinet which holds a remarkable selection of hummingbirds. There is something incredibly curious and, I would say, almost macabre about this hummingbird display. The display cabinet is six-sided and geometrically perfect, and it's topped with the same blue and gold striped flaming urn decoration that we saw earlier on the pyramid cabinet. It's just an exquisite piece of 18th century neoclassical design. Elegant, glamorous and very dainty, and the tiny hummingbirds that are displayed inside the cabinet are also exquisite and dainty, but in a completely different way. They are natural creatures, and the juxtaposition between them and the obviously man-made cabinet creates a startling and perhaps even disconcerting experience for the viewer as we see these creatures who were once alive and so vital and beautiful, frozen, static, and taxidermied within their neat obelisk. The stark contrast between the two creates an almost lurid effect, I would say. Ah, uh, but this uncomfortable contrast is perhaps what makes this particular museum so special and important. Personally, I feel we should be challenged by the evidence of what our ancestors chose to do, and I think it's quite good to be reminded sometimes of what we humans do to our fellow creatures. 
even though the specimens on display in this museum are centuries old and are relics of a bygone era, they can still provoke debate, challenge the onlooker, and make us question our own thoughts and assumptions, which makes the museum a compelling and educational experience for the visitor, I think. Let's continue now and turn the corner at the end of the hall, walking along the western side of the museum, where we'll find a tall door that leads to the mezzanine gallery level upstairs. We'll come back to that later. But for now, let's continue our tour of the ground floor. The room has been designed to be classically symmetrical, and so, as we walk across the bottom of the hall, we'll find another obelisk cabinet full of hummingbirds, flanked by another two cabinets of parrots, to match the other side of the room. And as we turn the corner and begin our exploration of the south aisle of the museum, we'll also find, lying on the floor, the other half of the Bowman whale jawbone. And again, it's been carefully placed so that it lies in perfect symmetry with its companion on the other side of the room. There's also another pyramid-shaped cabinet at this end of the room to match up symmetrically with the one by the entrance door. And once again, this is filled with a variety of eggs and delicate bird's nests. One of these nests is very unusual. It's been made by a red oven bird, a South American species that derives its name from the fact that it builds a large clay nest with a dome-shaped covered roof. This roof, and the fact that the nest is made out of clay, combine to act as a sort of natural oven, and it helps to keep the bird's eggs incubated at a much higher temperature, so that the parent birds can spend more time out and about, foraging away from the nest. As we walk on down the south aisle of the museum, we'll find a further variety of songbirds in the base of the central bank of cabinets, with a selection of waterfowls above them. However, I'd also like to draw your attention to a series of larger birds that have been mounted so that they're sitting on top of the central display cabinets. And they're all facing the same way, so they look rather as though they're about to start processing down the centre of the room. Just above us, in this procession, we'll see a snow goose and a swan. And mounted in between these two large white birds, there's a very unusual-looking specimen who has a dramatic, featherless red face, a long curved bill, and a tuft of wild feathers sticking out along the back of his neck. This remarkable-looking creature is a hermit ibis, which, according to biblical legend, was one of the first birds that Noah released from the ark and which was also worshipped by the ancient Egyptians as a living embodiment of Thoth, the god of writing, wisdom, science, art, and magic. Moving further along, beyond the ibis, we'll find a selection of relatively sleek-looking ducks, and beneath them a collection of corvids the family of birds that includes crows, jackdaws, jays, magpies, and ravens. Like the vultures we encountered earlier, corvid species also tend to be traditionally associated with death and are quite often feared as a result. However, also like the vultures, they're a breed that I'm very fond of. They're extremely intelligent birds, capable of solving quite complex puzzles, and even making their own tools. And the raven, in particular, is an utterly majestic and beautiful species that I think deserves our admiration, rather than our fear. Meanwhile, in the exotic species cabinet on the opposite wall, we'll find a selection of owls and woodpeckers, as well as a wreathed hornbill, which has a huge curved orange beak 
and a vivid blue throat. One can only imagine what the original students at this museum must have made of so many strange and wonderful creatures. In a time when there weren't many public zoos, when travel was limited, and when photography simply didn't exist, the ability to observe and study these specimens at close quarters must have seemed almost miraculous. However, today, in a sad reversal of circumstances, there are birds on display in this room which might have been seen in the wild during the 19th century, but which now can only be viewed in a glass case because the species has become extinct. One such example is the passenger pigeon, which was a native of North America, but which was voraciously hunted for sport during the second half of the 19th century and became officially extinct in September 1914, when Martha, the last known passenger pigeon, died of old age in Cincinnati Zoo. The history of the passenger pigeon is for me another reason why museums like this are so important. They remind us of the responsibility we have to other creatures that we share the planet with. So far, we've only seen some avian representatives of those creatures. But let's discover a wider range of them now by retracing our steps back to the western end of the hall and mounting the stairs to the first floor gallery. At the top of the white painted staircase, we find ourselves in a narrow anteroom, which is also lined with cabinets and which holds a variety of rocks and minerals on one side and a selection of skulls and skeletons on the other side. There's also a high upper row of cabinets containing a selection of stuffed primates who are joined in one corner by a freestanding and rather morose looking orangutan. There's also a freestanding lion who lurks on top of the cabinet of skulls in what is presumably meant to be a ferocious pose, but he's an extremely old lion, an elderly specimen who in truth is beginning to look endearingly moth-eaten. If we walk through the anteroom into the main upstairs gallery, we'll find another incongruous combination of natural marvels and elegant neoclassical decoration. The gallery runs right around all four walls of the hall, and it's framed with an elegant neoclassical balustrade made up of interlapping ovals. Like the lower half of the room, this upper level is almost perfectly symmetrical, with a single exception being made for a semicircular balcony which projects out just in front of the entrance to the gallery and which holds a beautifully decorated white and gold neoclassical table with three matching chairs and, to the right of them, a rather magnificent stuffed peacock. Let's turn left and walk along to the north side of the gallery, where we'll find the section of the museum that's dedicated to invertebrates, which is to say, creatures that don't possess backbones. The first cabinets we come to contain a wonderful collection of corals, followed in turn by a beautiful display of shells including a small collection of nautilus shells. Like the octopus and the squid, the nautilus is a cellophod, which means it's a marine mollusk with a set of tentacles. However, the nautilus also lives inside a shell, and it's a particularly intriguing shell, because it takes the form of a perfect logarithmic spiral. This means that, as its size increases with every turn of the spiral, the shell's shape remains unaltered. And you can see this phenomenon for yourself, as one of the nautilus shells has been cut in half to reveal the spiral chambers within it. The Swiss mathematician Jacques Bernoulli was so fascinated by the logarithmic spiral that he christened it the Spira Mirabilis, or Miraculous Spiral and its form can be witnessed in many aspects of nature, from tiny flower heads to the spiral arms of distant galaxies. 
Continuing on towards the far corner of the north side of the gallery, we'll find a display of invertebrates that are perhaps less popular, and to many people far less pretty than the shells and corals. These are the arachnids, a classification of species that includes ticks, mites, crabs, scorpions, and, of course, spiders. The term arachnid is culturally linked to the spider because it's derived from the name of Arachne, who, according to the Roman poet Ovid, was a mortal woman who was very proud of her talent for spinning. So proud was she that she entered a tapestry weaving competition against the goddess Athena. And needless to say, it didn't end well. When Arachne won the challenge, Athena ripped up her tapestry in a fit of pique, and Arachne was so mortified that she hung herself, after which Athena turned her into a spider so she could continue spinning forever. It's a slightly creepy myth, and so too, I must confess, are the exhibits that are on display in this corner of the room. There's a striking selection of spiders and scorpions who have been preserved in alcohol in individual jars, and they look, frankly, as though they belong on the shelf of some evil witch's apothecary. Let's leave the spiders and the scorpions behind and turn the corner to the narrower east side of the gallery, where we'll find a small selection of fish exhibits. The most impressive of these is the full-size skull of a hammerhead shark. These are extraordinary-looking creatures that have eyes positioned at either end of a pair of flattened protuberances which stick out on either side of the skull and are known as cephalofoils. It's these cephalofoils that create that distinctive hammer-shaped head that gives the shark its name. And seeing the actual skull close up, with its extraordinary protuberances and its sharp teeth, is really quite an experience. Hammerhead sharks thrive in warmer waters, so they're usually found in the southern hemisphere, off the coasts of Africa, South Asia, Australia, and South America. It only takes us a few short steps to walk along the eastern wall of the gallery, and then we can turn back along the south side, where we'll find a selection of snakes and amphibians. Once again, there are several specimens preserved in tall jars, but my favourite exhibit in this section of the museum is the paradoxical frog. This fascinating creature is so named because its growth cycle is, indeed, something of a paradox. While the rest of us begin life as very small beings, and we gradually get bigger as we grow older, the paradoxical frog does things in reverse. It begins life as an absolutely enormous tadpole, up to 27 centimetres or 11 inches long. And then, as it grows older, it gradually shrinks in size until, when it's mature, it's actually a normal-sized frog. Beyond the paradoxical frog, there's a collection of marine fossils, including the teeth of a 215 million year old crocodile. And then there's a further collection of songbirds, followed by several cases of mammals. This part of the gallery includes a cabinet full of ghostly-looking bats who have lost the pigmentation in their wings over the past 200 years, and so they look very white and almost see-through. There's also a large selection of furry mammals, such as mice, squirrels, and other members of the rodent family. However, my favourite animal in this section, and in fact one of my favourite animals, of all time, is the platypus. 
As I'm sure you know, the platypus is a native of the Australian continent, and it's a semi-aquatic mammal, which means it divides its time between the water and the land. It also features several rather contradictory characteristics. For example, it's a warm-blooded mammal, and yet it lays eggs like a cold-blooded reptile or a fish. And it's a furry animal, with a body structure and a tail that is similar to a small beaver. And yet rather than having a conventional mouth, it has a bill that looks very much like a duck's beak. These strange and contrary traits make the platypus completely unique, and, some would say, rather bizarre. But perhaps that's why I'm so fond of it. Continuing on around the final corner of the gallery, we'll find ourselves back at the western end of the room, close to where we came in, and we can finish off our tour of the museum by discovering two of its most extraordinary sets of exhibits. The first of these is a cabinet full of incredibly realistic-looking wax fruits, which were made between 1795 and 1813 in the workshops of Friedrich Justin Bertuck, a publisher and arts patron who lived at the end of the 18th century. There are 193 different wax fruit models in this display, and they include apples, pears, cherries, plums, and peaches. The collection is particularly fascinating for horticulturalists, because around two-thirds of these fruit species are now extinct, and that means that the lifelike wax models are the only means we have now of knowing what these fruits once looked like. Each one has been carefully made and is hollow on the inside with an extremely thin shell of around two millimetres, which makes the fruits extremely fragile. Consequently, they're very rare because many of Bertuk's pomological specimens have smashed over the years. So this delightful display in Bamberg is particularly precious. The second set of remarkable exhibits I'd like to show to you is in the cabinet next door to the wax fruits, and it's made up of a collection that is also man-made, although once it pretended not to be. This is a selection of stones, known as Beringer's Lying Stones, and they play a starring role in an astonishing story of natural history fraud that took place in Bamberg in the 1720s. At the time, there was a local physician and university professor called Adam Beringer, and he was making an enthusiastic study of fossils. In 1724, he was approached by three farm boys who had brought him a selection of strange fossils, which, they claimed, they had found on a mountain slope outside the nearby town of Eibelstadt. Adam Beringer was delighted by this find, and over the next year, the three boys continued to bring him many more fossils, which featured very clear outlines, some would say suspiciously clear outlines, of various small vertebrates and invertebrates. Beringer's colleagues at Bamberg University weren't convinced, and they warned him not to take the supposed fossils seriously. But carried away by his excitement, Beringer decided to write and publish a magnificent volume about his findings, and it was only when it was too late, after the book had been published, that he discovered that, of course, the stones were all fakes. It turned out they'd been maliciously planted, in fact, by an academic rival of Beringer's, who wanted to discredit him, and who had actually taken the trouble to bribe the farm boys to carry out the deception and ruin Beringer's reputation. The fake fossils subsequently became known as Beringer's Lying Stones, 
And when Franz Ludwig von Ertel founded his bird hall, he bought them to put into his collection, perhaps as a stern reminder to the students of the university that they should always maintain their scientific rigour. The lying stones are now famous, or rather infamous, within natural history circles, and they are so curious looking and so incongruous that they actually make a very fitting final exhibit to admire in our tour of this strange and marvellous museum. Our visit to the Bamberg Hall of Birds is now coming to an end, so we can return through the anteroom, walk back down the stairs, and make our way past the many wonderful bird exhibits on the ground floor, until we reach the door where we first came in. I do hope you've enjoyed this exploration of the Bamberg vocal style with me, and I hope too that you can join me again soon for another ASMR adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.